we're going to do the Unit 3 concept review for your AP test. Unit 3 is mostly vocabulary, though, and then being able to use that vocabulary to conduct a simulation or design a survey or design an experiment. So you just need to make sure you know the vocabulary so they know that you know what they're asking you for. So, so for chapter 11, 12, and 13, simulation, surveys, and experiments, Chapter 11 isn't necessarily super popular on the AP exam in that they don't generally ask you to complete an entire simulation or they don't ask you to multiple choice questions about simulations. Um, it comes up because of random assignment and being able to design something, but it doesn't come up very often. If it does, then you should know how to do it. So. There are steps to a simulation, and you already have this page, but, <laughs> but I have redone it so that you can have it again in case you threw it away or lost it or whatever. So I also have an example to pair with this so you know what you're talking about. If we're going to build a, build a simulation, we're going to specify how to model the component, which is just a building block, using equally likely random digits. We're going to identify the component and explain how you'll model the component's outcomes, so how you're going to assign those digits. So here is my example. A large manufacturer of batteries knows that historically 10% of its batteries come off the production line defective, and the remaining 90% of batteries come off the production line in working condition. Conduct a simulation to estimate how many batteries the company needs to pull off the production line in order to be sure of ending up with 10 working batteries. So if we're going to describe how we would conduct the simulation, then we are going to first talk about the component and then talk about how we're going to assign digits. So a component of this simulation is one battery. Each battery is represented by a digit. All right, 10% are defective and 90% are working. So I will assign zero to represent a defective battery and one through nine to represent working battery. All right, so that's the first two steps. Just give the component and then give how you're going to assign the random digit. Then we talk about trials. Explain how you'll combine the components to model a trial and state clearly what the response variable is. So to model a trial, that means you're talking about, well, what do you do with those digits? And then the response variable is what you're looking for at the end. So back to our example, it says, we want to conduct a simulation to estimate how many batteries the company needs to pull off the production line in order to be sure of ending up with 10 working batteries. So I will generate random digits until I have 10 working batteries represented. For each trial. I want to know how many batteries the company needs to pull off the production line to do this. So my response variable is the average number of batteries it would take to ensure the company gets 10 working batteries. All right, so there are the trial, how to model trial, and the response variable. Then you actually have to run the simulation. 
Now, if you're actually going to run a simulation on the AP exam, they're going to provide you with a random number table, provide you with some way they can follow your simulation. That's why they don't use them very often, because they have to be able to follow it, and there's a lot of variables that could be at play in how you actually conduct one. So, to erase all this, Show three trials by clearly labeling the random number table given below and specify the outcome of each trial. So, again, we're trying to get 10 working batteries. Zero was defective and one through nine were working. So we have working, defective, working, 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 defective, working, 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 working. working. Actually, I've gone too far. We just need 10, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Once we have 10 working batteries, we can stop. So that took us 12 batteries in order to get 10 working batteries. Then we do the second trial, same thing. We want 10 working batteries. So working, 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 working. Just took us 10 batteries. There weren't any defective in that batch. Same thing in trial three. Defective, working, 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 working. Defective. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We need one more. 10. This took us 13 batteries. That's how you run the simulation. So then we're going back to here, our, to our notes. The last step is to analyze the response vari variable. We collect and sum summarize the results of all the trials. We did that already. And state your conclusion in context. So we're going to state our conclusion. They want to know how many batteries they need to pull off the line in order to ensure they get 10 batteries. Well, from this, these three trials, 10 plus 12 plus 13 divided by 3 The company needs to take 11.6 repeating, or approximately 12 batteries, from the production line to ensure they get 10 working batteries. According to my simulation. That's not a for sure thing. That's just according to this simulation. All right, so we just defined a component. We talked about how we're going to assign the digits. We talked about what we were going to do for a trial. We talked about what we were trying to accomplish at the end. We did the three trials. We labeled everything. And then at the end, we stated a conclusion based on our simulation. That's what Chapter 11 was all about. Make sure you're careful with assigning your random digits. They sometimes ask for um, multiple choice questions about this. We have to make sure you assign the digits correctly. So if your component outcomes are based on multiples of 10, then you can use digits 0 through 9. But if they're based on other percentages, you need to use double 0 through 99. Um, you can ignore digits. Um, if there's only, you're trying to get 57 in a certain dorm room that have different attributes, then you only need 57 numbers. It's not based on percentages, so that's OK. Um, you can skip over those. Remember, if you're looking at double digit numbers, you have to always look at double digits. That's why I always put double zero to 99. Right? You have to look at two digits at a time in that case. You can't just look at one digit for 0 through 9, then double digits for the rest of them. You'll always look at double digits. Okay? That's chapter 11 in a nutshell. Chapter 12 was about surveys. This is all just definitions. Do you know the definition? If you do, you can answer the questions. If you don't, you're going to struggle. So, simple random sampling, or SRS. You'll see that written a lot. That's the basis for all other types of samples. You just assign numbers to those in the sampling frame. Remember the sampling frame is the set of people you select your sample from.
and you generate random digits to select people to survey. This is the most basic kind. This is the most uncomplicated type of survey method. Stratified sampling. You separate the sampling frame into groups and then do an SRS within each group. Other, other words, sample a little of each group. We talked about school here as an example. You would separate our school into freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and then you would sample a few from each of those classes. Cluster sampling. Separate the sampling frame into groups and choose groups at random, then do a census of those groups. So you sample entire groups. So again, using school as an example, we have freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, but then I randomly select a group of individuals, so let's say it ends up being juniors, and then I survey all of the juniors. All right, you do a census of a group. Don't forget about what a census is. Census is when you survey everyone. Systematic sampling, you start at a random person in the sampling frame and then sample in a pattern every 11th person, every 5th person, etc. Multi-stage sampling is just a combination of those sampling techniques. So it's a layered method. So you maybe did one thing first, and then after you've done that, you go back and do something else. And then the last two here are invalid survey practices. But they're still types of sampling. They're biased, but they're types of sampling. Voluntary response sampling is surveying people that are invited to respond. So you have call-in or internet surveys, or you publish something in the paper, something like that. And then convenient sampling is sampling those in the vicinity are convenient to the surveyor. So maybe I stand in the cafeteria and ask everyone that walks by, or stand at my locker and ask everyone that walks by. You also need types of bias. If you don't know the types of bias, that can come back to haunt you on the test. So Voluntary response bias, everyone is invited to respond, but the sample isn't representative of the population, right? If you have a voluntary response survey, then you're inviting biased answers, because only people with strong opinions are going to respond. Under coverage, some portion of the population is left out in the process of choosing the sample. So if we did a cluster sample of our school, Again, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. If you only survey all the juniors, when you designed that survey, you knew you were only going to pick one class, and that's probably not representative. That's under coverage. You don't have any responses from freshmen, sophomores, or seniors. That's a problem. Non-response bias, an individual chosen for the sample, so someone that's already been indicated that they're going to be sampled, can't be contacted or refuses to participate. The people that do not respond may have different opinions than those who do. So non-response would be if there are a lot of people that you can't get a hold of or refuse to participate. And then response bias is anything that would influence the responses. Wording of the question is a big reason to have response bias. And then maybe the demeanor of the person that's interviewed. If they have no inclination they want to be surveyed and you're just there asking questions, they might just be responding with silly answers. All right, so response bias is somehow you're influencing the responses. That's mostly chapter 12. Make sure you know the survey technique. And then chapter 13 is observational studies and experiments. So you have two types of observational studies. You're observing the subjects in an observational study. Maybe there are actual people. Maybe it's just records. You're not actively assigning anybody to a treatment or assigning anyone to any particular change in their environment. You're just taking notes, essentially. Retrospective studies are identified based on some commonality, and then historical data is reviewed. So we're looking into the past. Prospective studies, you identify some subjects, and then they are observed as events unfold. So that might be that you are doing something just over one day, or be over 10 years, but those are prospective studies. The big part of Chapter 13 is experiments. In an experiment, the biggest thing to remember is random assignment is important. If you don't talk about random assignment when you're designing an experiment, you're not going to get full credit on the free response question. All right, so we have different layers to an experiment. First of all, we have the subject or the experimental unit. That is who you're going to perform the survey or the experiment on. All right, so let's say it's this class. You guys are my subjects. I'm going to do an experiment on you all. Okay? You have to decide some things. There's the factor, 
And that's the explanatory variable, something that's being changed. Maybe I want to see if I split you guys in half randomly, some sort of teaching method if it would work better. So I teach one half of the class using one method and one half of the class using another method. Well, the factor is study is um, teaching technique. There could be levels. Levels mean that you have variation within a factor. So if we go back to like the plant experiment from middle school, if you have a plant and you have three different seeds that you planted and you have some that you put and then you re replicate so you have different seeds, you're going to see which one responds to sunlight better. So three different types of plants. Type of plant would be a factor. And then looking at different types of sunlight, that would also be a factor. Then you might have levels. So the sunlight might be full sun or half sun or no sun. That would be level. The treatment is the combination of all the levels and factors. So maybe the plant is in the um, sunflower as a plant. So there's a sunflower group. And then you have full sun, no sun, and half sun. Well, each one of those is a treatment. Then you have the response variable. Again, just like we've talked about before, that's just what's being measured. At the end, I'm looking for growth. Or I'm looking for, in my example about the class learning different ways, then I'm looking for who performs better on an exam or a quiz. If possible, you want to have a control group. It's not necessary, but if, if possible. Sometimes it seems silly to have a control. So when we go over your test, there's a ex perfect example on the multiple choice about when you would not want to have a control. A control group just gives you a baseline, right? So for um, any time you're doing like a medical trial, well, you're going to have some sort of group that doesn't actually get the medicine that you're trying out. So you need to know how people react in comparison to those that are just getting the pill. Um, generally, that's a placebo, which we'll talk about in a second. You can have single blind or double blind experiments. Single blind means one group is unaware of what's happening. Again, they know they're in the experiment, but they're unaware of the treatment or how they're being administered. Double blind means there's multiple groups that are blind or unaware of the treatments being administered. Again, those groups are those who could influence the results and those who evaluate the results. Okay? So if you have people that could influence the results that don't know that's single blind, or if you have people that evaluate the results that don't know that's single blind. Double blind, both of those groups wouldn't know. There would be some master person in charge of the experiment that would have all that information, but would code it in such a way that no one really knew what was happening. And then they would get all the information back at the end and be able to make some sort of conclusion. Placebos, again, are fake treatments. You want that to look like another treatment, um, but should have no adverse effects. That way you can see if there's some psychological component generally to what's happening. Blocking is huge. Blocking is like stratifying a sample. You're putting people or subjects together that are similar. So maybe I'm doing some drug trial and I think it's going to have a different effect on blood pressure for men and women. Well then I would want to do women and do the experiment with just women and then men and complete the experiment with just men, which means I blocked on gender. It's important that you block on something that is common and you think it's going to have an effect on the response variable. Again, another perfect explanation of that on the Unit 3 exam when we go over that. And lastly, you have confounding and lurking variables. All right? Confounding variables are where you have one factor associated with levels of another that you often don't really know about or uncontrollable, and so you have a conclusion that cannot be determined because of this interconnected relationship. Two things are so closely related, you don't really know which one is the cause and, or which one has the effect on that result. All right, so be careful about confounding variables. Lurking variables is just a variable that makes it appear that two other variables have a cause and effect relationship. So lurking is something that happens in the background that connects things. We talked about that a lot in Unit 2. For example, we talked about um, general health in a country compared to cell phone availability or technology availability. Well, so if you looked at it, it looked like cell phones, the more 
a country had cell phones, so the health got better. So it looked like cell phone use caused better health. But that's not really what it is. The lurking variable would be economic development in the background, right? If you have a higher economic development, then you have more access to technology, which means you also have more access to health care. Okay? So that would be a lurking variable, something that wasn't taken into account originally. Compounding, again, it means they're interconnected, that so you can't separate them. Right? You aren't sure what causes the other, which is responsible. All right, that's the gist of chapters 11, 12, and 13. Um, again, it's a lot of definitions. You need to know the definitions. In the AP exam, for your response questions, they generally ask you a survey or an experiment question, so you need to be prepared for that. Hopefully we'll look at some more examples of those, but you need to be prepared for answering those types of questions.